Good afternoon. Welcome to the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in Kansas City, Missouri. My name is Dr. Michael Robertson. I'm professor and chair of humanities at Johnson County Community College in Overland Park, uh, Kansas. And uh, today I'd like to share with you two uh, works of funerary art from the museum's classical collection. The first is a wonderful Hellenistic lion that dates to around 325 uh, uh, BCE uh, that guarded uh, a cemetery in Athens and a wonderful Roman sarcophagus that dates to the uh, 3rd century uh, CE uh, that uh, has a wonderful uh, uh, depiction of the muses and the patron of the arts who is, uh, was the deceased interred in the uh, sarcophagus. So come on into the Nelson and enjoy. I'd like to share a little bit with you of this uh, wonderful uh, marble lion uh, that dates uh, to the uh, first uh, quarter of the uh, uh, fourth century uh, BCE. Uh, this uh, lion here uh, uh, would have guarded a cemetery um, in, the, um, in, in, in Athens. Uh, again, you want a cemetery to be guarded, so what better thing to have than this wonderful lion, an apotropaic uh, symbol, fancy Greek word that uh, means to uh, ward away uh, evil. Um, this uh, uh, a lion, <clears throat> if you go to the Nelson's uh, webpage, has a, a wonderful video uh, that talks about the restoration of this uh, uh, work of art, which is a really good teaching video uh, for people who want to get some idea of how these uh, works of art, when they're taken, excavated out of the ground and, uh, and restored, what that process uh, is uh, all about. Lions as guardians uh, date uh, way back into antiquity, especially in terms of uh, Egyptian art. Uh, in the first dynasty, we have an early pharaoh, Menes, whose uh, burial chamber uh, that's uh, placed in the ground, uh, a couple burial chambers uh, in front are sacrificial animals, mostly of which uh, are lions. So we see uh, this traditions of lion as guardian and protector uh, is quite uh, uh, early. Of course, we are all familiar with the, uh, uh, the Sphinx on the Giza Plateau that guards uh, Khafra's uh, uh, pyramid and uh, mortuary uh, 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 temple. And that, of course, is the seated uh, uh, lion that has the uh, face of the uh, portrait of the pharaoh Khafra there. And I want to, to uh, recall that because I'm going to be coming to uh, a similar comparison with this lion uh, a little uh, later. Uh, later on, during the reign of Tutmosis uh, IV, um, uh, in the uh, uh, 17th and 18th dynasties of Egypt. Again, the lion becomes very, very popular uh, in Egyptian uh, art, especially, again, using them to, um, to guard cemeteries. So they're not really indigenous uh, to the uh, Greek world. Um, they really come into fashion in Greece at the time of Alexander the Great, uh, who, of course, expanded Greek uh, power to Egypt and the uh, ancient Near East all the way to India. And, of course, uh, Greek influences went East, but also Eastern and Egyptian influences come into uh, uh, Greece as well. So this lion here uh, that we see uh, at this, in this Hellenistic period is part of that uh, uh, tradition. But when is a lion not really uh, a lion? If we go back to the Sphinx, of uh, Giza, we have to understand that the Sphinx is a, is a hybrid uh, creature, and uh, hybrid creatures are, are monsters. That is, the Sphinx is half lion and has the face uh, of a man. So if we look at this uh, lion here, what we find is a, uh, is a monster, again, as well, uh, composed of various parts. If we look here at the back of the lion, the hindquarters, those are not the hindquarters of uh, a lion, but in fact they are bovine, probably that of an ox. So here we have the hindquarters of an ox. Uh, on the back, the back is more of the, um, the, the um, spine uh, of a goat. If we look at the rib cage, however, what we see is actually a horse. So all of a sudden we now have bovine, we have a uh, uh, a um, goat and we have uh, a horse uh, chest and so we're now 
more in the Greek world of the chimera. The chimera was this mythical uh, three-bodied beast that had the body of a lion, it had the tail of a serpent, and then growing right out of his back was this uh, head of a goat. So here we are taking uh, the Greek tradition, importing this uh, Egyptian tradition of lion as guardian, but then if you look here at the front with the front uh, uh, hind quarter, uh, front uh, paws here, they're really not paws, but what do you see? And that is more of the posture of a dog. Uh, and again, we're now back in the Greek world because in the Greek tradition, it is dogs that guard the uh, entry into the underworld. And of course, we are now uh, in the world uh, of Cerberus. Cerberus is this three-headed dog who guards the entrance to uh, Hades. So what we have is this wonderful uh, mixture of the lion sphinx uh, with the body of a uh, of a lion and the face of a man. And if we look at this face of this lion, what we see is the face is rather human. And especially if we look at, at the eyes. Uh, the eyes and especially uh, around um, uh, the eyes as well, the, the articulation of it. And uh, what I believe we see here is a reference to Alexander the Great uh, himself. Um, Alexander the Great uh, in the portraiture by his official uh, uh, portrait uh, sculptor Lysippus uh, had a certain um, uh, iconography when dealing with Alexander the Great. Um, one of them is uh, again a sort of a slight turning uh, of the head is one of them. Uh, another is Alexander had this sort of moppish uh, hair with this particular um, um, parting or tuft that's uh, here uh, right at the top and we see that uh, again with this lion uh, uh, as well. Um, but most importantly uh, I think was this element of uh, that Lysippus uh, created and this is a word, Greek word pothos which means something like a, um, spiritual longing when we see the uh, portraits of Alexander the Great, there's this um, sort of um, uh, concerned longing uh, that uh, he has because Alexander the Great when he died ascended to heaven and he there uh, is this guardian of humanity which is exactly what uh, the word Alexander uh, means in Greek, uh, the protector of, uh, of humankind. So as a result we see in this uh, wonderful um, a lion guarding uh, this uh, cemetery is this wonderful fusion of um, Egyptian traditions of God, uh, of lion, man, God, protector, uh, now articulated in a more uh, Greek context where we've pulled in the chimera, this Greek mythological beast, and uh, also fused in the Egyptian tradition of uh, the Sphinx as the garter, uh, where we have this sort of reference to the face of uh, Alexander uh, the Great, who, as I said, uh, would have uh, recently deceased um, at about the time that this um, uh, sculpture uh, was um, articulated. So they're all around the, uh, the basic uh, same time frame of uh, the uh, rise of Alexander the Great, and then, of course, his, uh, his uh, death and apotheosis uh, into uh, uh, heaven. So if you uh, come to the uh, Nelson Atkins uh, Museum of Art and you come to this great uh, uh, space here, uh, do um, spend some time with this uh, line. Go online uh, and uh, see the wonderful video that talks about how this uh, was uh, restored. And uh, if you have uh, a, a smartphone, um, you can actually uh, plug into the Nelson's um, a website, punch in a, a number, and you'll be able to then uh, hear a guided tour that talks about this line uh, as well. I'd like to share with you um, uh, this wonderful third century Roman sarcophagus uh, here in the Nelson's Classical uh, Collection. Uh, this sarcophagus here is rather interesting, uh, especially if we take the, the word sarcophagus itself. The word means uh, flesh eater. Um, early sarcophagi were made usually out of uh, limestone and therefore when the body was placed into the uh, sarcophagus uh, 
uh, the limestone it would believe to help to uh, break down the, the flesh and thus leave uh, the, the bones uh, intact. So thus the word sarcophagus, uh, flesh eater. Uh, sarcophagi are attested to uh, in the ancient world as far back as the Minoan period in Crete in the Bronze Age uh, in two forms, one that looks like a bathtub and another one that is roughly a square but it would have a top on it uh, and it was basically to imitate uh, a house and so therefore the deceased was uh, sort of housed for uh, all eternity. Uh, in Greece, uh, sarcophagi were not all that uh, common as grave markers. Uh, if you've been to a museum, you often see those uh, kuroi, those uh, statues of, of youths. They would be placed uh, on the grave markers. And then above ground, uh, gravestones, more like what we uh, tend to have here, uh, here in the United States. Um, <clears throat> the Romans, uh, uh, actually the Etruscans before the Romans had sarcophagus uh, uh, for their burials. Um, but they weren't inhumation burials. Uh, that is, they didn't put the body in there. They were basically chests into which they would place uh, the cremated uh, uh, remains in, in urns. And very often the tops of those will be decorated with scenes of the deceased and perhaps his wife reclining together uh, banqueting. And very often they would be made out of uh, terracotta. We really don't get uh, uh, sarcophagi in Rome until the reign of uh, Trajan and um, in the uh, first uh, century. Uh, but really they become very, very popular later on in the reign of, of Hadrian and his uh, love of Greece. And so as a result, many of the scenes that we see uh, in those Hadrianic uh, sculptures are scenes from plays um, and, and drama, and sometimes banquets and stories of, of Dionysus. Later on in the Antonine period and the end of the second uh, century, uh, Rome is very, very turbulent uh, and the figures are a bit more contorted, more compressed, and the scenes uh, are more tragic of uh, death and um, uh, just sort of mirroring the, 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 uh, uh, the, the times of the, of the day. And this continued into the third century. Uh, and as a result, there was sort of a reaction towards all of that uh, chaos and um, the sarcophagi of this period tend to return to a more uh, a classical uh, ordering. And this is what we see here in this wonderful third century um, uh, sarcophagus uh, here. And if you look at the figures, uh, the proportions are a little less classical. Actually, what we see are the, uh, um, the facial uh, proportions and the proportions of the body that we're going to see pretty soon in late antiquity and early uh, Christian uh, uh, art. Here we have uh, a scene of the nine muses uh, from uh, Greek um, uh, mythology. <clears throat> and here in the center we see the, uh, the patron uh, uh, who is a woman and she is wearing a, a toga. So here she uh, clearly is a, a very wealthy and powerful uh, woman of the uh, third century. And uh, as a patron of the art, she wanted to uh, immortalize herself, uh, just as this building here uh, immortalizes uh, William Rockhill uh, Nelson and also Mary, At Mary Atkins uh, as well. And here in Kansas City, when we think of the Halls and the Hellsbergs and people like that who are very much, uh, and the Kaufmans, uh, very much involved in the arts, this is exactly the same idea that we see here in antiquity. And she's standing here in the center next to Minerva, who is the uh, Roman uh, counterpart of Athena who is the uh, patron uh, of the arts. Uh, on each side are the nine muses, the nine um, uh, deities who uh, personified uh, all the various uh, arts of the ancient world. You can't tell one from another from uh, the facial uh, expressions, as is very typical of uh, uh, Greek art especially and of classical art as well. So the way they're identified is by what they are uh, holding uh, in their uh, uh, hands. So if we start over here uh, at the left here, at the very beginning, we see the muse Polyhymnia, uh, the muse of uh, sacred music. And um, she would normally have a, a scroll in her hand as we see here. And because she's dealing with sacred music, she would usually have her head uh, covered in a veil. And you can see uh, here her garment, 
Uh, she's got her shoulders covered and it's pulled all the way up. She's not fully veiled, and I think this is more of a stylistic element just simply to have all the muses' faces um, exposed. But she is uh, all the way up to her hands. So uh, basically everything is covered uh, except her hands uh, and her feet and her face. And she's in a sort of gesture uh, listening uh, to uh, perhaps Euterpe, uh, who is right next to her, who is the uh, uh, muse of lyric poetry. And she has this very wonderful uh, flute uh, in uh, her hand here that she would have uh, played. Uh, next to her is uh, Thalia, uh, the muse of, of comedy. Thalia means something like uh, the boisterous or the booming, loud-voiced one. And she has a shepherd's uh, crook here and the comic um, mask uh, in her uh, hand. So we're able to identify her as well. And since tragedy and comedy are uh, closely linked together, we have next to her Melpomene, who uh, has this uh, co uh, tragic mask in her hand, but mostly we can tell that she's the uh, muse of uh, tragedy is because she's standing on these large platform shoes here. This is a, a dramatic a convention that we see also in Japanese uh, theater, kabuki theater as well, where since uh, um, tragedy deals with stories of heroes and especially of gods, um, they basically stand on these platform shoes here so that they're, uh, so that they're elevated. Uh, and they're not touching the ground. It gives a more, a more uh, godlike uh, stature. And then uh, next to her is uh, Erato, uh, the um, muse of erotic love poetry. And uh, we can uh, really tell that she is uh, Erato because look here, she's got her, her shoulder exposed in this kind of uh, little sexy thing going here. Um, and she has her foot here on a, uh, on a box, a cosmetic box, that would have held uh, not only her, uh, her musical pluck that she has the lyre here, but perhaps also her um, cosmetics uh, as well. And as I mentioned here, we have the, the, um, the Roman woman who is unknown, and then of course uh, Minerva here uh, in the uh, 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 center. Um, then we have um, uh, Cleo here, uh, who is the muse of, of history. Uh, the Greeks thought of history writing as, uh, again, one of the uh, uh, great arts um, as well. And she's uh, very wonderfully uh, tapping uh, on the shoulder of uh, Terpsichore, she who delights uh, in the dance, and perhaps a little bit of movement here that we see in her um, knee, giving an idea that she's uh, an element of movement. And she also holds this uh, a lyre uh, as well. Um, then we have uh, Urania, and she is the uh, muse of, uh, of uh, astronomy and astrology. And she holds in her uh, hand a globe symbolizing uh, the heavens. And then finally, at the end, we have Calliope, uh, she of the beautiful voice, and she is the muse of, um, of epic poetry, of the type that we have of, of Homer and uh, um, for the Romans, Virgil's Aeneid. And here is her box that she would have her writing tablet and her stylus that she has in her hand as she's composing her uh, heroic uh, uh, verses. So it's a very wonderful uh, uh, work of, uh, of third century Roman uh, uh, sculpture and again a good example of a, a sarcophagus that um, we have from Rome. And we can lastly tell that it is a Roman sarcophagus and not a Greek sarcophagus, mostly because it was excavated uh, in Rome, but also in the fact that it's very frontal. Um, Roman sarcophagi, like Roman temples, are frontal. You enter them from the front uh, and um, you, you can't go behind them. Whereas in the Greek world, uh, the Greek sarcophagi were very, very large and monumental, and they were sculpted on all four sides and meant to be for kings and uh, pharaohs and uh, things of that nature. So they were very ostentatious public um, uh, uh, works of, of, of sculpture. So this is here very, very frontal. There are uh, winged uh, uh, griffins on either side. These are winged lions, and they are um, apotropaic. Uh, a fancy Greek word for um, uh, warding away uh, uh, evil. Well, thank you for uh, your attention and uh
come to the Nelson and visit uh, this wonderful room of uh, classical antiquities.